Hi, I'm Bake Adafi, and this is Bible Study Verse by Verse. We're studying through a book of the Bible a verse at a time. This series of lessons is on the book of John. If you would find your Bible and open it to the New Testament, to the Gospel of John, we'll begin in just a moment. John is the Bible book we're studying. This is lesson 15 and we're beginning with John chapter 1 and verse 43. If you'd like to open your Bible there, we'll begin in a moment. We have a free offer of a written Bible study for you entitled, God is Immutable. You can request a copy by emailing me at the address shown at the end of the lesson. Let's begin by reading John chapter 1 verses 43 through 49. The same day following, the, the day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Then Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in, in whom is no guile. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessing now on your word. Help us to study the Son of God, the King of Israel. Help us to understand uh, how the Old Testament prophecies enable these simple fishermen and um, ordinary people uh, to see this extraordinary man, the Lord Jesus, and be prepared for him in their hearts. Lord, prepare us to receive him, um, whether we've been saved for a long time or whether we're just on the verge of being saved or whether we've never heard this gospel message before. Lord, uh, bring some soul to you. Uh, help uh, them to understand your word. Give your spirit, Lord, um, and give understanding. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, we're continuing in the book of John. This is chapter 1. We're on, we've got to verse 33. And uh, verse 29 talks about <clears throat> John seeing Jesus calling him the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And then uh, that was the first day. The second day, um, verse 35, John stood and two of his disciples, and he calls him the Lamb of God again. And then the next day, uh, John, uh, Jesus wants to go forth into Galilee. In other words, he's, um, he's in Galilee. That's where he's from. That's where Nazareth is. That's where Canaan of Galilee is. That's where the Sea of Galilee is. It's north of, um, north of Jerusalem, north of Judea, north of the city where the temple is. It's up into the north. And he, he finds Philip and he calls Philip and tells Philip to follow him. So Andrew has followed the Lord Jesus himself and brought uh, Peter to him, uh, Simon Barjona, Simon son of Jonah, his brother to him. And now Jesus calls Philip Philip was of the city of Andrew and Peter, and he found in Nathanael and said to him in verse 45, We found the one that Moses and the law and the prophets wrote about, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So he makes a testimony that he believes that uh, it, it shows that these people were primed for this. They were looking for this Messiah to come, and they were believing it. They had faith that God would send to them the Messiah that he had promised. And their faith was based upon <clears throat> the Old Testament scriptures, um, the, the um, 39 books of the Old Testament that the Jews um, were careful to tra transcribe perfectly, letter by letter, and they maintained the integrity of those documents. Um, Moses in the law and the prophets did write, that includes all the Old Testament, uh, the prophets and Moses. And he identifies Jesus as being um, 
the one that's the Messiah um, and the one that's written about in the Old Testament. And Nathaniel said to him, I mean, this is kind of a proverb. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Um, in other words, Nazareth was kind of a, a hick town. It was a backwoods. It wasn't a place well known for anything. Um, it was, um, you know, what we would call um, a hayseed place, um, you know, of not, not much reputation uh, in the world. And um, Jesus is identifying as coming out of there and being the son of Joseph and and Nathaniel, you know, is, is dubious about it, doesn't think that, <clears throat> you know, anything's good's going to come out of, out of Nazareth. And Philip invites him to come and see. He, he's a, he's, he, he, like Andrew, has identified um, this person as being the Messiah. And he inv he's inviting his, I mean, this is a disciple making a disciple, <laughs> if you will. Becoming a fisher of men. That's what we're supposed to do as disciples. Um, you're not really a disciple unless you're also uh, making disciples. And Jesus sees him coming and um, says about him, I mean, he's already talked to Peter and uh, uh, told Peter who, who he was. He never did meet him before and um, give him a new name. Now Nathaniel's coming and he, he's, he knows Nathaniel. I mean, his um, omniscience is on display. His godhood is on display. How does he know these things? Well, he's God. He knows everything. And he said of them, he's an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. So he identifies him as, a, as a, a, he doesn't say, okay, this guy's a fisherman. He identifies him as an Israelite indeed. So um, it's someone who is uh, primed and ready and looking for the Messiah to come. They had this hope that their nation would um, bring forth the Messiah, the Savior. And uh, Nathaniel was like that. And the others were like that. We can see it from their testimonies. They looked for the Messiah to come. And he was an Israelite, and in him was no guile. That means he didn't uh, have any falsehood in him. I mean, he was what we would call a straight shooter. He uh, told it like it was. He didn't... Um, he didn't gild a lily. He didn't embellish things. He just um, just told the truth. And, you know, unlike so many people today um, who you can't get a straight story out of them uh, about anything, this guy wasn't like that. He told the truth. And um, Nathaniel asks, how do you know me? I mean, I, I've never met you before. This is our first meeting, and you're, you're identifying me as... Um, and having no guile, I mean, it might, he, know, he must know that it's true. You know, that's really the way I am, and this guy knows that, and he knows that I'm an Israelite. In other words, uh, I am waiting for the coming of the Messiah. I am looking for that. I am primed for it. I'm ready for it. You know, come any time. <laughs> and um, Jesus says that he saw him before. In other words, he could see what Philip was doing and not even be in the vicinity of where Philip was. And he saw Nathaniel under this tree. <clears throat> and this is enough um, evidence in Nathaniel's mind uh, for him to understand that um, what um, Philip was saying was true of this man, that he genuinely was uh, the Son of God and the King of Israel. And he makes this statement about Jesus' deity um, based upon um, this little bit of evidence that Jesus uh, gives him of that. Fantastic story. I mean, we don't hear much about uh, Philip or Andrew or Nathaniel uh, all throughout the rest of the scripture. I mean, they're there and they are forming the, the foundation for the church. And, um, you know, there, there are uh, 11 of them that are true. One's a false guy, Simon, uh, I mean, Judas, who betrayed uh, Jesus. But 11 of them are true disciples, and he is one of them. And um, he is an Israelite indeed. There's no guile in him. You're going to get a straight shot when you ask him a question. Um, so 
<clears throat> what we want to do is um, understand um, how um, Philip and Andrew and Nathaniel arrived at the conclusion that this was indeed the Messiah, the promised Savior that was to come, that was spoken about in the Old Testament. Where did that come from? What was their faith based upon? I mean, these guys were not scholars, but they were religiously educated. They had been to their synagogue. They had heard uh, the truth pro proclaimed, even if it was proclaimed by people who didn't believe it themselves. But it was read, it was published, it was made known. And uh, we're going to look back at some of the things in the Old Testament that led uh, these people to make this conclusion that this indeed is the Christ, the Messiah. First place we want to look is in Genesis chapter 3, if you'll turn there. Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to look at um, verse um, 15 in particular. This is uh, Genesis chapter 3, as you're probably familiar with, is the sin entering into the world. Adam and Eve are in the garden. Uh, they've been created and they're perfect. Uh, everything that God made was good. Satan comes to them and uh, tempts them to uh, eat of the tree that's in the midst of the garden of the knowledge of good and evil, and they fall to that temptation. Sin enters into the world, and God begins to um, interrogate each one of these people and, and, uh, and, and send <laughs> basically the results of sin upon their head. Adam and Eve die spiritually. They're dead toward God. Um, their relationship with God um, ends. Um, the Spirit of God leaves them. But verse 15 is particularly a promise uh, of the Old Testament uh, about Christ's coming and, and what He would do. And um, it's, it's God speaking to Satan uh, in the garden. And he, and he says this, I will put enmity, I, God, will put enmity, that is, disagreement, warfare, um, um, un, un good, uh, terrible feelings between you, Satan, and the woman. So the woman and Satan are not going to get along. And between Satan's seed and her seed. So um, there's going to be um, between the woman and the woman's seed and Satan and his seed, there's going to be enmity or, or strife or, or conflict. And then a prophecy is made. Well, this, is, this all is a prophecy. It shall, it shall bruise thy head. It shall bruise thy head and you shall bruise his heel. So the prophecy is that, now we're going to go ahead and look in other places to prove that this seed is Christ, but um, Christ is going to bruise the head of Satan, and Satan's going to bruise the heel of Christ. So this happened on the cross. Um, um, Satan had uh, entered into Jesus, had Jesus uh, crucified. He was behind the situation. He was behind the first sin. He thought he could take care of, um, of the Christ coming into the world. He could, he could destroy him by having him killed. And he was the, the force behind uh, his death. The scripture says that if he had known what he was doing and, and how that would have been the thing that destroyed him, he wouldn't have done it. He basically shot himself in the head as he had Christ crucified because that is God's uh, triumph over sin. Um, God um, defeated death and he defeated sin and the death of the Lord Jesus. Uh, Satan didn't understand that. And here's the prophecy of it. Uh, the first prophecy of the Messiah. Granted, it's veiled. It's, um, it's difficult to understand. I mean, I would much rather have my heel bruised than I would have my head bruised. I mean, if you catch your, if you swing a sledgehammer and miss and hit your foot, you know, you're going to be jumping around, but you're not going to die. But if somebody hits you in the head with a sledgehammer, um, you know, in my employment, I used to uh, investigate accidents, and uh, in one of them, uh, a person uh, put a put a big, um, like a big crowbar, only it was straight, into a machine. It was about five foot long. The machine cycled, and the crowbar uh, became a, a cantilever and just struck him right in the back of the head, and he fell dead immediately. I mean, that's 
what is ha going to happen to Satan uh, in the future. Uh, the, the prophecy here is in the future that Christ is going to bruise his head. He's, he's, he's going to be defeated. His, Satan is, is, his head is crushed. And um, as he crushes Christ's heel, Satan's head is crushed. I mean, these people, this is Moses. This is what Moses and the prophets wrote about. This is the prophecy about Christ as it begins in, in the very beginning uh, of sin. You know, God is promising a Savior to come. Well, turn now to uh, Genesis chapter 22 and verse 18. Genesis 22, and God speaking to Abraham, and he says, In your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So, um, the seed of Abraham, you know, we could think of it as his offspring. Um, he had um, um, Ishmael and uh, Isaac, and Ishmael became a great nation. They weren't blessed by God. They were rejected. Uh, Isaac uh, was the promised child that uh, God gave to Abraham through his wife, Sarah, and um, he was the inheritor of the promise. And then he had um, uh, Isaac. Uh, he had Isaac, and then Isaac had uh, Jacob and Esau. Esau was rejected. Uh, uh, Jacob was chosen, and then Jacob had, Jacob had 12 sons. Those 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel. They went down into Egypt, came out, went down into Egypt, 70 people, and came out a million and a half, two million people. And they, they became the nation of Israel, and out of them, and out of their history, then Christ is born into the world. And, and here, um, here is a promise to Abraham. Here's the gospel preached to Abraham. This is as much of the gospel as he had. Um, it was veiled at, at, the, at, the, at the fall that Christ would bruise Satan's head, Satan would bruise Christ's heel. Here it is, um, in thy seed so all the nations of the earth be blessed. So. Um, Christ is going to be a blessing to all nations. It's not just going to be um, the one individual nation of the Jews, although they were greatly blessed by God. They had all the benefits. You can read all about it in Ephesians chapter 2, all the things that they had going in their favor. But um, the, the real blessing is the gospel coming upon all the world, as it did after Christ came and, and uh, the apostles and prophets took it to all the world, laid the foundation in the scripture for the gospel. And, uh, and now the gospel is for all nations. Um, it, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed because you have obeyed my uh, voice. Okay, um, now turn to uh, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8. And it says, uh, And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith. So the heathen are the Gentiles, the people that are non-Jews. They are going to be justified, set right with God, have a relationship with God through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in, the, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So that's the gospel to Abraham. That's what he needed to know, that what was coming um, that Messiah that was coming and, and he believed God and he looked forward to that and that's the thing that saved him. He was saved by his faith. He believed God counted to him for righteousness um, the scriptures teaches us. So that's Galatians 3 verse 8 look at verse 16 and uh, that was the gospel to Abraham and verse 16 says now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Now this is where the Bible is very specific about its words and about their meanings. Um, he says, uh, verse 16, And he said not, and, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So that idea of that seed being a singular thing, the seed that was coming to bruise Satan's head was the Lord Jesus Christ. That seed of Abraham... He had a whole nation of people that, that flowed out of him, more numerous than the stars and the sands on the sea. But that wasn't the seed. 
It, it was physically, but the real seed, the spiritual seed, was the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that is the consummation of the gospel. The gospel resides in him. He's the one that, in his name, that you're saved if you have faith in him. Um, it wasn't unto seeds as of many, but as of, to one and to thy seed, which is Christ. So Christ was the one who came, um, and this is what um, these disciples who are primed and ready understood uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit upon them gave them faith in this this is the one we've been looking for I found him come see oh, can anything good come out of Nazareth we'll come and see and then he's making this confession after this little you know exchange with Jesus that you know I saw you under the fig tree oh you're the you're the son of God you're the you know you're the Messiah that we've been looking for and, I mean, these people, uh, even though they were of low estate in the world, they were rich spiritually as they believed the promises of God in the Old Testament. We'll now turn to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1, <clears throat> another prophecy of the Old Testament that these disciples were looking for. That's how come they knew this was, that Jesus was the Christ. <clears throat> says in chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts. So, <clears throat> this is uh, the Lord Jesus talking, and he says in, in, in a prophecy through um, Malachi, He's going to send his messenger. That messenger was John the Baptist. I mean, we can fill this in because we have the whole... It, it, we're, we are now looking at it as a historical event. God sent John the Baptist as the messenger who would, it says, prepare the way before me. So that's what, John's, um, what John did. The angel appeared to him and told his father that... or appeared to his father, Zechariah, and told him in the temple, this is going to be the one that prepares the nation for the Lord Jesus. He'll prepare the way before me, and the Lord, that's the Lord Jesus, whom you seek. In other words, these people are looking for him. They're understanding that this is going to happen. This, there's, this is a, there's a 400 year gap after Malachi before uh, Jesus comes on the scene. There's 400 years that transpire. It says he'll suddenly come to his temple. The temple in Jerusalem. Jesus shows up the king has arrived in his temple, the one who, who, who is to be worshipped there, the one who it's all about, um, even the messenger of the covenant. So he's the messenger of the covenant of the New Testament, the New Testament in his blood. He brings that message to the nation of Israel and then to us Gentiles as well. Whom you delight in, behold, he shall come, says the Lord of hosts. These people looked for this. These people had anticipation about this. They were looking for that messenger of the covenant to come. And they first looked for um, the forerunner, the one that was going to prepare the way. And that was in John the Baptist. So um, here it's all coming to fruition. These Old Testament prophecies are happening. And, and these people are recognizing that Moses and the prophets talked about this particular man, the Lord Jesus. Um, now turn to um, Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah 61, we're going to read verses 1 and 2. Um, and um, also turn to um, Luke chapter 4. So Isaiah 61 and Luke chapter 4. So Isaiah 61 verses 1 and 2, it says, These are, this is a prophecy about the Messiah. And this is the Lord Jesus speaking. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He speaks in the Old Testament. He speaks through the prophet Isaiah. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. This is, uh, we'll see in Luke chapter 4, this is Jesus's, um, Jesus claims that this is him and that he's doing these things. This is his, um, this is him fulfilling this prophecy uh, of Isaiah. He's going to preach good tidings to the meek. He's anointed by God. That's what um, 
uh, Messiah means. He's the anointed one. He's the Christ. He has God's approbation. He has God's approval. He has the Father's testimony that this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear Him. Uh, the Holy Spirit descends on Him like a dove. Uh, the Father speaks from heaven. This is my beloved Son. So He has anointed um, by the Father. He has sent, to preach, he preaches the gospel to people that are meek. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and opening of the prison, or prison to them that are bound. These things are all what Jesus did as He did His miracles, as He preached, as He went throughout the land of, um, of Galilee and of Judah. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. So here was the prophecy of the uh, messianic prophecy of Jesus' coming. Um, these disciples that he's calling, they understand this from the Old Testament. Turn to Luke chapter 4. Uh, it says Jesus is in uh, his hometown of Nazareth. Um, he has become famous. His fame has gone out through all that region, and he's come back to Nazareth. He's in the synagogue there. It's the Sabbath day. He stands up to read. He gets the book of Isaiah. He turns to chapter 61. Of course, they're not numbered like this uh, then, but he knows exactly where this is. And he reads this. He says, he found the book, and he found where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So he quotes this Old Testament prophecy about him, and he says, um, 20 says, he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down and everybody's eyes are fastened on him in the synagogue and he began to say to them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. I'm it. I'm the Messiah. That's talking about me. That was written 700 years before this time. I mean, we can't tell what's going to happen tomorrow. And God, God, the Holy Spirit, inspired Isaiah to write these words down 700 years and Jesus said this is who I am I'm preaching the gospel I'm I'm the fulfillment of this messianic prophecy and there's sermon after sermon within the context of what is um, or what this prophecy was but what I want you to see is that these people who were his disciples knew about this they were looking for him they uh, these prophecies um, were fulfilled in Christ, and they understood that. I mean, when he showed up, they were primed and ready to receive him. Um, okay, one more place. So turn to uh, Psalm 110, and also turn to Matthew chapter 22. So in Psalm 110, we're just going to look at verse 1 there. It's a Psalm of David, and it's a prophecy. And Jesus uses this in Matthew uh, chapter 22 to confound his enemies, those who are seeking to destroy him and discredit him and prove that he's not who he says he is. It says there, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit on my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. All right, so it's kind of veiled. It says, what in the world does this mean? We'll turn to... Um, Matthew chapter 22, and um, Jesus asked the Pharisees, it says in 40, 41 of chapter 22 of Matthew, when the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think you of Christ? Whose son is he? They said unto him, The son of David. All right, so he set him up to knock him down. And what he's going to ask them is about that prophecy in Psalms 110, verse 1. He said to them, How then does David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit on my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how, he is, how is he his son? So he proposes um, a prophecy to them that they cannot explain. They know that the Messiah is going to be a son of David. But how in the world is David calling his son his Lord. So let's untangle this. 
um, he asked them whose son is Christ. And they say the son of David. Then 43, how then does David in spirit, so David by the Holy Spirit calls his son, Jesus, the Christ, his Lord. At, when he says, the Lord God said unto my Lord Jesus, sit on my right hand. So Jesus is seated at the right hand of God in heaven, and his enemies are being made his footstool. That's what we find in 1 Corinthians 15. Where is Jesus now? He's seated at the right hand of God in heaven. What's happening? His enemies are being made his footstool. He's reigning over all the earth. He's delivering up the kingdom to the Father, just like it's been promised before he comes back and, and delivers it up completely. And if David calls him Lord, how, he is, how is he his son? And these, these uh, religious people, these educated people, cannot understand this, um, this question that he poses to them. We don't get it. Verse 40, uh, 46 says, And no man was able to answer him a word, neither did any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. They were just astounded. And they were uh, bamfoozled. They were hoodwinked. They had no idea how to answer this. Um, in their mind, it was an impossibility. And, I mean, we're looking back on it, and we can see that uh, Christ descended from David, uh, you know, as in, in the lineage of David, and, and, um, and, and Mary, and both Mary and Joseph came, were of the tribe of Judah and of the family of David. Uh, but, but Mary was his mother, and the Holy Spirit um, um, impregnated her with the second person of the Trinity, and God became a man, and um, that's how uh, David's son is now David's Lord, because the Lord God, the Eternal One, the second person, the Son, is that Lord, and yet he is the son of David. So that's what they missed. They missed who Christ is. These disciples, these simple fishermen, get it. The head guys, the Pharisees, they don't get it. It's a mystery to them. And you can see how out of this, Jesus gave up his life willingly. When, when he offered no defense, when he was taken to trial, and he offered no defense, you can see what he could have done. He could have turned him inside out. He could have gotten off. But his purpose in coming to the world was to die. He came uh, as a man into the world in order to die for sins, in order that our sins may be forgiven, in order that God may pour out his wrath on him instead of us. And we get to go free, and we get his righteousness, and he takes our penalty. How marvelous is that? That's what these simple fishermen understood as they talked to Jesus. Their faith was transferred. Their faith was forward-looking. They look for the Messiah. Now they've found him. And now they're beginning to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They're beginning to believe that this is the one that we've been looking for. This is the one that our nation has, um, has longed for. The Deliverer, the Messiah, the Christ, our Savior. And they're beginning to believe on him. So these simple fishermen gave a testimony. Um, as the Holy Spirit revealed to them who Jesus was, as they believed the Old Testament prophecies of Moses and the prophets, as they saw them fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they began to follow him. They became his disciples. They began to lay aside their sin. They began to understand how they needed to live. And um, upon their testimony, uh, our faith is based. We have um, their record in the scripture of who Jesus was and what he did, and it's accurate and it's true, and it's worthy of our faith being placed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, just like theirs were. Well, uh, we're going to end there um, in, it, in it, uh, verse 49. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you'd bless some soul that hears this message, that they would believe it, that they would repent of their sins, that they would trust in Christ. Thank you for Moses and the prophets and all the messages that you gave um, to 
um, Israel by them and that um, we can have uh, the same kind of faith that these d disciples had in the Lord Jesus that uh, rest upon the Lord, the Lord Jesus and that saves us. Lord, thank you for his Messiahship, for him being anointed by you. Thank you that he was omniscient and knew everything and uh, knew Peter and knew Nathaniel. And thank you for the, the good testimony that they give about who he is. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching. In the next lesson, um, lesson 16, we'll begin with chapter 1 and verse 51. I hope the Lord blesses you as you study his word. Here's a description of the free title we're offering with this lesson. <clears throat> it's title number 17, and it's called God is Immutable. God never changes, period. He is not affected by time. The heavens and earth will grow old like a garment and be changed, but God is always the same. Out of this fact, there is a multitude of benefits which flow to Christians. So if you'd like to get a copy of this lesson, Lesson 17, God is Immutable, you can uh, write for it. Or if you have questions or comments about this lesson that I've just taught, you can email me at Bible Study v by v at gmail.com. And please don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more Bible study verse by verse.